good afternoon and to our folks on the west coast good morning welcome to baker hostetler's six-part webinar series entitled the emerging new era for non-competes and trade secrets today's topic is non-competes and trade secrets yesterday today and tomorrow my name is joyce ackerbaum cox i'm an, i'm a partner in the orlando office of baker and hostetler and with me is my partner, John Siegel, who sits in New York. John is a partner in our New York office and together we co-chair Baker's National Non-Compete and Trade Secrets Practice Group. We're gonna to talk to you today about non-compete issues. Before we get started, a couple housekeeping issues. Our program today and uh, the other five subsequent sessions are gonna last about 30 minutes. We're gonna to try to keep to that time. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type it into the Q&A box. Uh, we will try our best to answer them either during the presentation or if not, we will reach out to you afterward to answer the question. And we will also provide you our contact information if you have any follow-up questions. The other housekeeping issue rega is regarding CLE credit. Uh, I know many of you are looking for CLE credit and we are offering it for several states. So to ensure that you get this, please, at the end of the session, you will have to complete the brief survey that is sent to you. There's a link on there that specifically asks you to fill out information as to what state you need or state or states you need CLE credit for. So turning to the webinar series itself, I think everybody on this call knows there have been considerable both proposed and actual changes in the arena of non-competes and trade secrets. There are a lot of things in the pipeline and certainly many more things to come. So we developed this series because we as National Practice Group are closely watching these issues and we wanted to accomplish a couple main things. The first thing I'll say is that this is not a non-compete primer or a, a series that's gonna go over the basics. We're expecting that those in the audience um, and participating in this series have considerable, at least baseline knowledge of non-competes and how they're structured. So we're not gonna go over the basics, but our goal is to have short, brief discussions about legal changes and legal issues, and to give some practical forward-looking advice and thoughts uh, with respect to many issues in this area. You're gonna hear from our non-compete and trade secret practitioners over the, around the country throughout this six part series. Um, we have people positioned in every region of the country that do this type of work for Baker Hostetler. And one thing that I will say is, it is obviously very common that state laws differ tremendously in this area. One of the things that we're gonna see and one of the things that a lot of people know is that successful or unsuccessful enforcement in this area or defense of these claims will often come down to your choice of law or what state law is presented. And that's one of the themes that's gonna run throughout this series. We wanna highlight how state laws are increasingly becoming more and more disparate and how you should approach this from a business and legal standpoint if you're a multi-state or a national employer. So let's go ahead and um, get started. John, I wanna pose the first question to you. How do you view the world of non-compete and trade secret claims generally in recent years and particularly in today's climate? Yeah, Joyce, I, I think it truly is a new era. Uh, and why and how it's a new era will be a main, the main theme of this series. I think we're gonna see two principal impacts. First, non-compete and trade secrets claims overall are going to be and are becoming harder to prosecute. And second, as a consequence, the tools businesses use to protect trade secrets are going to have to be used in a much more strategic and surgical way. It really is a, a, a national trend. Non-competes are increasingly viewed with greater skepticism. You know, start right at the top. The president of the United States is calling for curtailing the use of non-competes. 12 states and the District of Columbia have enacted limitations or in some cases prohibitions on the use of non-competes in the past five years alone. Uh, academics and advocates 
in the pages of the New York Times and elsewhere have focused on perceived abuses of non-competes and their economic effects and an FTC rulemaking proceeding on the role of non-competes and what should be done about them in the economy is about to begin. This trend, these trends, and it is a national trend, are having impacts. Look, judges and arbitrators are people too. They're highly literate, highly public attuned people. They see these things, they read these things, they see these developments and they're affected by them. The Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act on the books now for five years, which has made trade secrets, uh, federal intellectual property akin to patents, trademarks, and copyrights, is having a paradoxical effect. It's opened the federal courts to trade secrets claims. And we look at the filings under the DTSA nationally every day, and it's very clear that a great deal of non-compete and trade secrets litigation of all sorts uh, that was previously being brought in state courts have just moved across the street to the federal courts. That subjects these cases to the exacting standards of federal courts. On motions to dismiss, federal courts apply the Iqbal and Twombly standards, which are higher, more exacting standards than in most state courts. Under the federal rules of civil procedure, live witnesses are required for preliminary injunction hearings. This means if you're seeking a trade secrets injunction within the first several weeks of the litigation, you're gonna to have to put on your proof through live witnesses in court, which in most state courts, many state courts, you didn't have to do. Federal judges, many of them are former prosecutors, tend to require or expect greater specificity in pleading and proof. And, and most of all, they're used to controlling and protecting their own dockets. We've already seen cases in which federal courts dismissed trade secrets claims, litigants went across the street to the state courts and got a preliminary injunction. Uh, other developments, the Economic Espionage Act and Computer Fraud and Abuse Act increasingly being used in trade secrets matters have raised the stakes for egregious trade secrets misdeeds and, and perhaps diminished courts' appetites for more garden variety cases. Are there COVID impacts? I can't say, it's too soon to say. But with unemployment spikes and an, a, a, really a nationwide focus on employee mobility, it's hard to imagine there won't be impacts. And in some places, New York State, for example, the courts have, our highest state court has cut back on available damages, prohibiting avoided cost or head start damages in, in the E.J. Brooks versus Cambridge security seals decision. All of this is creating a changing and more complex landscape than before. And Joyce, I think the question for you is, how do you see these developments affecting enforcement and affecting business decision-making day-to-day in the non-compete arena that you handle in employment matters? Well, I think that you've touched on a lot. Let me briefly um, give my opinion or what I've seen with respect to the COVID issue. Obviously, that is still playing out, but we've seen courts around the country, as with other types of litigation, handling everything COVID-related differently, right? Some courts are completely shut down. It's impossible to get a trial, nonetheless, uh, you know, an emergency injunction or TRO hearing. So that's problematic if you've got you know, to run into court as we often do in these sorts of cases. Um, so, and anytime right now, I think certainly for the next year or two, you've got to factor in delay um, on both sides of the equation and how you're going to deal with your non-competes going forward. Um, but with respect to kind of some other trends that I'm seeing, John, in addition to what you've said about um, the DTSA, some of the other federal acts, one of the things that I think that judges are doing is as certain judges become or have less tolerance, I will say, for these types of non-competes, which basically um, sit people out altogether, they're looking to use less restrictive types of measures. So they know that there are other types of restrictive covenants out there, uh, and they're looking to say, well, I can do something of a lesser standard or in a 
that has a smaller impact. So maybe I'm just going to look at enforcing a non-solicitation provision, or maybe I'm just going to look at enforcing a garden leave provision. Um, a garden leave provision for obviously, for those of you who don't know, you basically pay the employee to sit on the sidelines during the period of the non-compete. We're seeing more and more um, judges look to, I think, less restrictive measures other than an outright ban. The other thing, the other trend that we will see and that you're going to hear about later on um, in one of our future sessions is the antitrust implication and overlay of all of this. So we have seen a huge kind of push by the Department of Justice, by state attorneys general, and certainly by private plaintiffs, many times in the class action kind of context, which you know, focuses on businesses, not just in the criminal, excuse me, not just in the civil range, but for DOJ now in the criminal range, where you've got to be really careful as a business, whether it's employer to employee or business to business, having those contracts contain certain type of restrictions that you've had in place forever are not going to fly. Um, so we're seeing from as far as a trend, we're seeing a lot of uh, re-looking at those agreements, revamping, and hopefully, um, you know, we're, we are seeing some uptick in enforcement uh, against businesses in these sorts of areas. So things that people definitely need to be uh, prepared about. Joyce, do you see other technological or economic trends that are uh, contributing factors in the difficulties of enforcing unfair competition and non-compete claims? Yeah, I think that um, certainly in the trade secrets arena, right, and our folks in, in uh, California and some places on the West Coast and other areas where non-competes have been disfavored or not allowed for a long period of time, um, they've been dealing probably more frequently with trade secrets types of claims than outright non-compete claims. But when it comes to trade secrets, I think what we're seeing is, you know, the theft is becoming more sophisticated, right? The theft nowadays, and I'm about to date myself, but is not walking out the door with the Rolodex uh, that has all the customer list or the contacts or whatnot. The theft is most often electronic in nature. It's harder to detect. It's far more expensive to track down and to litigate. It requires a lot of outside experts. And it's not just experts that go in and look at one level. You've got to delve down into the different systems and you've got to look and see where this information is transferred. Um, there's obviously a lot of nuances to that. And you know, as we're seeing just in general everyday life um, outside of the legal arena, thieves are becoming you know, more creative and uh, that is certainly having an impact here uh, with respect to certain types of cyber theft and trade secrets. The other thing that I will say that probably applies across the board with respect to non-competes and trade secrets is this very global world we're living in. It used to be, um, I think, far more important to you know, really craft a geographic restriction that was you know, not going to be national or global uh, because judges just didn't have a, you know, a tolerance for that at all and they wanted to see them, and they still do want to see them as narrowly tailored as possible. But a lot of times with you know, the way that we have you know, global competition around the world, certainly national competition, certainly um, it, things have become less important about geographic restrictions. And uh, I think it has become less relevant than it otherwise was. And I will say one other thing um, that goes back to your point before, John, about COVID. Um, one of the impacts we will see is remote workers. So before where people were working primarily for a company in one location, they're now working from their homes or from their vacation homes in different states um, or sometimes different countries across the world. So you've got to take into effect, where's the employee sitting? Where did the violations occur? Where's the company located? Where's the, you know, the, the former company located? Where's the new company located? All of those factors um, are going to, as they always do, play in the litigation. But now I think you have this added kind of sense of what do we do with remote workers who are not in the area where we originally thought they were going to be when we first drafted or intended, um, you know, this contract to apply. So um, I think those are some of the trends that I'm seeing. Um, and actually, it sounds rather overall dismal. It sounds like we're left with uh, 
more restrictive state laws, perhaps some looming federal laws with respect to um, what President Biden and the FTC are going to do, um, harder detection of, of claims generally, and an increased distaste by judges in the area. So, John, <laughs> with uh, that uh, kind of foundation, what's a business to do here? Yeah, I, I think that we all really have to pay very close attention to the public debate and the policy debate in this area and take it seriously regardless of where it leads because it is a, a foreshadowing or a highlighting of the areas that judges and arbitrators, legislators and regulators are concerned about and that uh, companies who are using non-competes and restrictive covenants to try to protect their trade secrets and other vital interests really need to act in a more strategic, tailored and concerted way to get out ahead of these trends. To some degree, it just exponentially increases the importance of some of the advice we've given in, in the past, but it really does require a lot of companies to rethink their approach to managing their employment relations and trade secrets risks. What, what do we mean by that? I mean, to be blunt, it's time to leave some of the heavy handed tactics in the past. Requiring non-competes without notice to employees at the beginning of an employment tenure is not a good practice now. It's not permitted in some states. It's going to be a principal focus of the uh, FTC proceeding to be sure. Um, and it's really on a going forward basis, not necessary for companies that get out ahead of these trends and deal with them proactively. Uh, by the same token, requiring non-competes across the workforce without regard to trade secret or customer poaching risk is a practice that's going to make it both more difficult for companies to enforce their restrictive covenants and increase the odds that states attorneys general, the FTC or others will, will start to focus on a company's uh, practices. What does that mean? Well, one obvious example now codified in 12 states plus the District of Columbia is that the routine across the board use of non-competes for lower salary employees is a disfavored practice. In some states, it's an unlawful practice. What the threshold is for lower salary varies. It's 100, and we'll get into this in one of the later sessions. It's $100,000 in the state of Washington. It's non-exempt employees under it, um, under the federal um, FLSA in some other jurisdictions. But as a general matter, requiring non-competes across the board for lower salary employees is a practice that should be phased out. Uh, long non-competes and what's considered long varies state by state to be sure, but long non-competes without compensation during a post-employment non-compete period for employees outside the C-suite are going to be harder to enforce. Um, no poach agreements where companies agree with competitors not to hire from each other. Um, that is the subject of Justice Department investigations as one of our partners will uh, described in great detail in a subsequent session. And no poach agreements, especially outside of the context of settling litigation, really are disfavored. And, and uh, lawyers advising companies um, need to be very, very careful when clients come and want to do those sorts of things. So best to avoid vague, broad non-competes and instead tailor them specifically to job responsibilities and to trade secret and competitive risks. Consider using the full array of tools, garden leave, short periods of 
notice requirements at the end of an employment uh, relationship, non-solicits, stock and deferred compensation for futures. All of these should be reviewed and considered and used not necessarily cumulatively. There's a whole literature now in academia on the cumulative use, the overlapping use of restrictive covenants itself being uh, an abusive and disfavored practice. But all of these tools used appropriately tailored to the job position, tailored to the trade secrets and other competitive risks in specific employment situations uh, should increasingly be used rather than just relying on blunt non-competes across the board. Now, Joyce, are there steps that you think that companies should take to try to implement these things or consider them as um, they look ahead at this more complex landscape? Yeah, I think um, the first thing that I think every business needs to do is pull out every one of their agreements um, that contains restrictive covenants. And again, as I said, this is not just employer employee uh, covenants, this is also business to business. Um, if you have these types of agreements or language or clauses in, within your agreement and you're never enforcing them, certainly you're gonna hear some advice and depending on the context, you may very well wanna scrap them because sometimes having them and doing nothing about them in the antitrust context is certainly more problematic. In the non-compete context, if you're never gonna enforce them, then there's no use to, to have them. And sometimes uh, we've had folks try to use the argument against us of prior waiver. Now there's places where that's successful and places where it's not, but it is a subject of discussion. Um, in addition to that, I think that you are gonna to wanna to be, uh, as you said, John, tailoring the non-competes, but you know, in addition to position and knowledge base and whatnot, you really have to pay very close attention to the choice of law provision and the venue because it is critical. As I said at the beginning, the state disparities are becoming um, you know, more impactful in this area. And what John sees in New York or Massachusetts or some of the other states where he regularly is, is very different than what I see in Florida and Georgia and North Carolina and some of those states. So regardless of all of this we're talking about, the, the state application of law and the venue are critical. And we used to say, you know, I, particularly for multi-state employers and national employers, you know, they want something, give me kind of a one size fits all. Well, there's never been a one size fits all in this arena, but we were generally safer drafting broader and leaving it to the courts that had the ability to modify our blue pencil to kind of narrow it down. But I think we're gonna see less of that. I think businesses are gonna to need to have different buckets of non-competes for different groups um, where they should anyway for salespeople or C-suite people or, or certain people that possess you know, IT information, engineers, et cetera. Um, but I think we're gonna see more buckets with different types of agreements. Uh, based on position and also based upon state law. Um, I think that the other thing that we're going to need to talk about is the um, advanced and strategic planning that businesses are going to have to have. Are they really, as I said at the beginning, are they going to be enforcing these? We need to look at, they need to have some idea so that when they call us, you know, on a Friday afternoon and say, you know, employee Joe just walked out the door and he's taking my key customers or he loaded a thumb drive and stole all of this equipment. What are we going to do? All this technology, I should say, what are we going to do? Um, we have, you know, some, some things in place, particularly when it comes to tr trade secrets. We, we do things such as trade secret audits. So for businesses, when obviously you're trying to enforce or defend against a, a trade secret claim, you have to know what are your assets, right? What are you trying to protect? And not just what are you trying to protect, but what are you doing to protect these things, right? What reasonable measures are you gonna be able to articulate that you have in place uh, that you rolled out to protect this technology because the courts are gonna to wanna to hear that. So I think um, a mix of all those sorts of things are gonna be some of the things that we're gonna um, be seeing and recommending to businesses to do. Is there anything else that you want to add to that, John? 
No, I think uh, that, you know, what we're doing here today is really a preview of where this webinar series is going to go over the next six months. So let's just take a moment and outline uh, for everyone who's, who's viewing uh, where we're going to go into detail in these areas that we've touched on today. And, and so uh, this, is, this series is going to be uh, a live webinar on the second Wednesday of every month, one o'clock uh, Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific and appropriate times in between. Uh, second Wednesday of each month, next October 13th, we're going to have a discussion of five years after the DTSA and what has the enactment of the first Federal Trade Secrets Act meant for trade secrets and non-compete litigation. That discussion will be led by Mark Temple, who's a Texas employment lawyer, and Carrie Buson out of DC, who's a trade secrets litigator. Uh, then November 10th, we'll talk about global reach in trade secrets, extraterritoriality, and DTSA enforcement beyond the United States. Uh, with Leif Sigmund, uh, a patent litigator, and, uh, and Tiffany Mia. Uh, on December 8th, we'll go into uh, real specific detail about the efforts in jurisdictions across the country to legislate fairness. There really is a national movement toward legislation regulating the use of the non-competes. So the first session on that on December 8th will be led by uh, lawyers in regions across the country. Mark Antonetti, uh, who practices in the Virginia District of Columbia and Maryland area, which now has its almost unified regional law uh, uh, regarding non-competes. Charday Charlemagne, a litigation colleague of ours, will discuss uh, the new comprehensive Massachusetts, both non-compete and trade secret act uh, we'll also touch on the very new uh, Illinois statute uh, further limiting the use of non-competes in Illinois. And then Sabrina Shadi, an employment lawyer in, in our West Coast office, uh, will discuss what really is not only California, but a Western regional now, uh, highly restrictive statutory uh, realm for the use of some non-competes from California with a flat out prohibition to uh, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, all of which in the last several years have adopted statutes limiting non-competes. And we'll then turn to the federal arena, Joyce, why don't you take it from there and outline the rest of the series? Sure. To uh, celebrate and bring in the new year, we will scare the pants off of you on uh, January 12th with our series called Nationalizing Competitiveness and Non-Compete Law, Criminal Antitrust and federal efforts to curtail no poach and non-compete agreements. We will be led by our partner, Ann O'Brien, who was formerly with the DOJ for uh, many, many years and led up this uh, antitrust division. And now uh, we have the good fortune of Ann being in-house. And uh, we uh, are very fortunate to listen to Ann because she's got some very great inside kind of mindset and information. I don't want to say insider information, but from her being on the inside, the way that people think, the uh, kind of projection of where the Department of Justice may go, what's going to happen with their first test cases that they've bought criminal actions in, and what businesses can expect to see from an anti-competition, uh, antitrust aspect there. And then we will finally complete our series with the sixth session on February 9th uh, called Future Shock, How to Protect Trade Secrets When Non-Competes Become Truly Disfavored. And you'll see John and I again and hear from us and we will uh, wrap up the series. So um, that's a kind of a preview of the next five sessions. I think as has been told to you or was on the invitation, the series is not necessarily cumulative. It obviously each particular uh, session has an individualized focus. So if you weren't able to join today or you're not able to join one, but you want to join four or something like that, um, you can feel free to pick up and you won't feel like you're missing or not able to get context because each one of these should stand on their own. And certainly um, podcasts are going to be made available for listening if you do miss a session. I can't imagine you want to um, 
necessarily listen to me, not so much John, but on your free time, but they will be there. Um, and certainly if you think that there are others in your organization that would benefit from this information, you can send them the links for the future uh, webinars to sign up, or you can have them listen to the podcast as well. So in conclusion, um, I just want to uh, invite you to listen to the upcoming series. Um, I think you see on the map there, you'll be hearing as John and I previewed from regional and local experts that are around the country in the Baker Hostetler non-compete team. If we can, I guess, get that up there, some technical issues. Um, and as we said, uh, please um, fill out the link to make sure that you get your CLE credits. And we hope that we will see you uh, at the next session on October 13th for the discussion of five years after the DTSA. And I apologize for the technical difficulties, but that right there kind of gives you the outlay of our, of our map and where our various litigators are around the country and some of the folks that you'll be hearing from. So in, in closing, thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you soon, hopefully next month. Thank you, bye-bye.